So the title of my lecture is going to be The Nature of Nostalgia and Nostalgia of uh, Nature. But talking about nostalgia, do we really want to go back to the 80s? So listen to the muffled sound of a uh, tape recorded. Nostalgia is a very loaded word. So I'm actually curious. Uh, please raise your hands if you think nostalgia is a positive word. Quite a few people. And, and who thinks nostalgia is something negative, has a negative connotation? Not too many people. Um, <clears throat> nostalgia has recently been, well, very cleverly used by concert, conservative nationalist politicians. We just had elections in the Netherlands and a far-right party has won by landslides. Nostalgic nationalists, they promise a future that returns to the good old times. We all know the phrase, let's make America great again. The good old times when things were much simpler, a past before globalization, when we still had national borders, you know, in Europe, when there was still a single clear enemy and our cities weren't flooded by refugees. And importantly, the threat of climate change didn't exist. Of course, this past did not actually exist. And nor will it exist in the future. Today I would like to speak about an alternative future though. A future which Svetlana Boym once said, dwells on the ambivalences of human longing and belonging and does not shy away from the contradictions of modernity. I'll speak about six, uh, maybe seven if you've got the time for it, projects that all in some way question this idea of nostalgia as a glorious homeland that you can return to. But before I proceed, I'd like to talk a little bit about our roots. I grew up in uh, a tiny village called Marese in uh, the Netherlands. It, it's very quiet, I can say. And then I went on to study uh, in Delft at the architecture school. This was during the area of super Dutch architecture. It was an interesting period because architecture started questioning conventional briefs and programs and proposed alternatives by layering and recomposing programs in different ways, new typologies emerged that were either commentaries on society or proposed alternative futures. It had the ambition to deal with some of the critical challenges of the time. However, the strong emphasis on the clarity of the concept also resulted in uh, a loss of the experiential and the physical quality of architecture. Architecture lost its relationship to the process of making. A building rather resembled exactly what the blue form model looked like, rather than emerging out of the logic of constructing. Architecture demanded attention to itself. The ambition of architecture was to become a spectacle with a clear intent to be new, not to be anything like, uh, and not to be like anything else, and to be detached from history and context. You could say an a-nostalgic architecture. Did I escape the Netherlands? Well, I wouldn't say it was an escape, but a quest for a different kind of experience led me elsewhere. An exchange program, uh, an exchange program led me to SEPT in India, the university founded by Pritzker Price winner B.B. Doshi, where Shefali, my partner, graduated from. While in Delft as a student, you were kind of left alone to chart out your own paths and explore your own interests among a multitude of viewpoints. In SEPT, the direct teacher-student experience prevailed. It was a tranquil garden of ideas where 
you still learned from your gurus. Here an architecture was taught that was contextually spirited, environmentally informed, and structuralist and modernist at heart. But it was also a place that was on the edge of being dogmatic to do a close-knit teaching and learning culture. In a quest for an architecture that whispered instead of shouted, that sought continuity instead of attention, our journey led us to Sri Lanka. There in the studio of Chana Daswata, we immersed ourselves in the world of Jeffrey Baba, an architect whose work you're probably quite familiar with. Baba's genius lay in a paradox. He didn't impose on nature. He instead let nature dictate. The wild beauty of Sri Lanka became the muse and shaping his di designs and concepts and eventually literally overtaking the buildings. Close study revealed the deceptive simplicity of Bauer's creations. What seemed effortly natural were in fact a product of meticulous interventions. Take uh, the Kandalam Hotel, for example, a masterpiece playing the disappearing act. And behind the lush greenery um, lay an intensive utilitarian scheme. Its columns and beams anchored violently into the rock surfaces of the surrounding forest. The architecture did twist and turn here and there to accommodate itself to nature, but in no way did nature, although helped along the way by uh, the human hand, stop doing what it does best, to adapt, to evolve, to improvise and surprise. The Lunuganga Garden is of course one of the highlights in Bala's oeuvre, more so because it's not about buildings here. The garden is about light, about skill, about proportion and time. So while it is about buildings, or while it is not about buildings rather, it is about architecture. Imagine our surprise then, when during one of our visits, when a heavy downpour turned this checkerboard hardscape into a submerged masterpiece. Lake, garden, and architecture now, even though temporarily, harmoniously collapsed into one. Bauer did not subjugate nature to the will of man, but in a way transformed our experience of nature. To contrast, he highlighted the rawness and the unpredictability of nature. Bawa's obsession with laying down geometries into the landscape resonated those inside the estate bungalow. Bawa's work relies heavily on vernacular typologies and construction methods. It may have been the result out of a certain level of pragmatism, a way to deal with the limited resources in the closed economy of socialist Sri Lanka at the time. It certainly would have led Bawa to work with the local materials and skill sets at hand. But learning how his earlier works performed, where he experimented with international modernism, he would have realized that vernacular typologies were much better suited to the climatic context, especially in a Sri Lanka that could not afford to depend on oil and electricity to create comfortable living climates. On the other hand, was Jeffrey Bauer also a very sentimental and probably nostalgic character, a person who seemed to long for a world long lost. This is him. Perhaps someone with a nostalgic yearning for an unburdened childhood, or at least the sanitized version of it, running around in the wilderness of his uh, family's estate. Or, as Lunuganga so cleverly evo uh, evokes, 
a, a kind of a wistful lo learning, longing for uh, romantic could have been. The possibility of other homes on other shores. Uh, Baba actually nearly settled down in a villa on the Garda Lake in Italy before he changed his mind and returned to uh, Sri Lanka. Early on in our career, we experienced firsthand these two extremes in pos uh, positions in architecture. The architecture of the spectacle and the architecture of modesty. The architecture of the new and the architecture of nostalgia. It was time to chart our own path and in 2006 we moved to Mumbai to start our own practice. We were looking to practice prioritizing context and building form, um, <clears throat> which we appreciated so much in Sri Lanka, but also the world was changing and urging us to explore alternative approaches rooted in conceptual thinking. Today our office uh, houses about 25 to arch 30 architects in Mumbai and Rotterdam. And the diversity of conditions we face from Europe to Asia demands constant adaptation. While a place like, for example, the Netherlands has so far been sp relatively spared of the reality of the globalized world, with its increasing peaks and valleys of wealth concentration. In India, we deal with the extremes in the economic status of our clients. This makes you constantly have to adapt, switch positions and, nego and negotiate. Exposing yourself to diverse situations also gives you the opportunity to build relationships and weave stories between them. It makes you flexible and it makes you agile. We navigate extremes from finding solutions for entire homes for the homeless, like this one, to within the same budget, selecting a luxurious marble lot for a bathroom for one of our affluent clients. The first project we designed independently was embedded deeply in this disparate world full of extremes. And it started with a story that germinated on a playground. Matthew Spacey had been living in Mumbai for a while, but was struck by the lack of places to play for children. He started out with some ad hoc rugby classes, sports coaching and mentoring, but soon expanded to programs, taking kids in a bus out into the wilderness. Here he helped children who had grown up in the slums and had not seen anything else but that in their life reconnect with the natural world. Through these programs, the boys and girls learned discipline, improved self-esteem and hygiene, and the benefits of working in a team in a healthy competitive environment. After a few years, he, the organization built an outdoor learning campus a 14-acre site with climbing equipment and zip lines and Jacob ladders. But during the hot summers and the rainy monsoon months, there was a need for more shaded spaces where the children could play and learn. What we designed was a composite of two programs, partly a challenge course and partly a building, an, an interactive building used as a gathering space and play area. And we located this learning pavilion over here on, on the confluence of four important landscape elements. A river, a soccer field, a hill, and a stream. We emphasized on these elements by strategically placing the various activities of this learning pavilion on either sides of the bank of the stream. And then the roof straddles across these different landscapes, tying them together. The learning pavilion is in building with uh, the purpose of, in abstract terms, educating children about overcoming challenges in life, overcoming boundaries. And it, that has sent it's actually an extension of the uh, existing challenge courses on the campus. Children learn to work with each other in terms 
in, and in teams to achieve those goals. The space below the roof is open to all sides. In the summer months, the shade of the roof creates a respite from the heat. The natural breeze flows from the river and cools the covered spaces. During the monsoon months, the pavilion becomes a dry haven to take cover from the heavy rains and the stream below come, becomes alive. Often children's play spaces are associated with very bright colors, but here we want to emphasize on the experience of the natural environment. The classroom becomes the outdoors and nature becomes the classroom. Most of our projects are located in very unique natural landscapes. Because of rapid urbanization, our sense of isolation from and loss of the natural world grows. And simultaneously, our desire for a place away from the life in the city increases. People have an inherent yearning to retreat to those undisturbed parts of the planet in order to restore the sense of loss. But how do we build in pristine natural landscapes? There is a dilemma that every architect faces when starting work on a new site. Should one not leave the site alone? Why touch it and why spoil it? The problem with this though is that if we believe, as William Conan puts it in The Trouble with Wilderness, that nature is where we are not, then we give ourselves the permission to evade the responsibilities for the lives we actually lead in our urban environments. If we designate the wild places as sacred, we in effect also say that our backyards, our roadside trees, our neighborhood parks are not valuable. Now, I would like to step back for a minute and elaborate a bit more in detail what we mean when we use the words nature and landscape. Firstly, I would like to re-establish that when we say nature, it is not actually what we would presume it to be, raw, untouched nature. In fact, as Simon Sharma elaborates in his book, Landscape and Memory, there's no word for raw, untouched, unseen nature. It, it does not and it cannot exist. Because as soon as the human eye lays its eyes on it, that which is raw is immediately transformed to a landscape, framed as well as in a painting in a museum. One could say that nature is as ephemeral as Eurydice. Seeing nature immediately implies that it vanishes. It becomes cultured and created. Landscapes are culture before they are nature, constructs of the imagination projected onto rock and water and wood. What you see with your eyes is actually defined by what your parents, your great-grandparents, romantic poets in the 18th century, and even the first Homo sapiens, picking up a seed and planting it and starting the agricultural revolution, saw in nature. Their fears, their adoration of the sublime, and their greed filters your gaze. Still, however, we are attracted to those pockets of landscape that seem close to what we imagine wilderness would have looked like. We desire to experience those places that we imagine we experienced in our childhood once more. And we want to relive those feelings, even though they are derived out of some what clouded memory of wholeness, of something that never really existed. This here is a place not far from the metropolitan area of Mumbai. From the hills, 
numerous rivers and streams find their way down to an undulating landscape, eventually feeding into the Bombay Bay. And our clients wanted to build a home here. They were not the first, but they certainly would not be the last. And with this landscape slowly filling up with self-important villas, they could easily become a part of the problem. And we asked ourselves, will we be able to create different relationships between the new settlers and this existing rural landscape? How do we intervene in this landscape, the home of farmers for over centuries, but now the playground of urban settlers? Can the building be made barely visible? Here, the roof settles just below the top of the hillock, camouflaging itself in the silhouette of the undulating landscape, but also sitting just high enough to be able to, be able to measure oneself against the surrounding landscape. The house is deeply rooted in architectural history. We combined four distinct typologies. The typology of an underground house, the courtyard house, a veranda house, and a lookout post. What you see gazing down from the top of the hill is just a cover of green. A courtyard in the center forges a connection with the roof and travels through the interior of the house extending past the pool into the landscape and tying together terrain and architecture to an experiential movement. Here in plan. The sequence of rockcraft courtyards, kitchen, dining room, veranda, screen, deck, pool, and then the riparian landscape is an experiential one, but it also acts as an instrument to measure oneself against the vastness of space. The climate here is unforgiving. Apart from the short winter, it's either scorching hot and dry, or the rain drops down from the sky with a tremendous amount of power. The natural landscape changes then from a, a dense, brightly green color, jungle-like forest during the monsoon months to a pale brown shrubby wasteland during the summer months. Our landscape design helps through the plantation of drought tolerant fountain grasses mitigate the transition through the seasons and a seamless transition to the surrounding river landscape. The veranda is an essential element of life in this climate. The bamboo screen acts as a filter, but also creates a sense of privacy. The building is made to age and weather. There's something sublime in this dramatic collision between the order of geometry and the unpredictability of nature that we saw in Baba's work as well. And at this intersection of both, it choreographs a unification or decay. It meditates upon the inevitability of time and the forces of nature. It indulges in a kind of a bittersweet sensation within which one can find both joy and comfort. The character of the house on the stream is very different. It is designed around a stream that is the protagonist around which everything revolves. And by breaking up the house in two parts and placing them on either side of the banks, the stream becomes omnipresent. The bridge and the pergola that connects the two buildings stimulates and even forces the users to move out of the comfort of the interior and experience the outside several times during the day.
it, it kind of makes you uh, live more in the moment. Tennessee Wilmer said about this, life is all memory, except for that one present moment that goes by so quickly, you can hardly catch it going. The pool here acts as an extension of the stream, but in the summer months, when the, dry, the stream dries up, it's a substitute for it. The outside and the inside shell are distinctly different, and internal spaces are defined with volumes created by the changing thickness of the internal ceiling. It's, it's poche, it describes the space inside the walls and ceilings, the space between the inner and the outer shell. And here it is part of the drawing technique as well. The heaviness of the exterior concrete mass is reversed by the lightness of the whitewashed ceilings and walls. Large sliding doors which span from floor to ceiling and wall to wall bring the outside into the interiors. Architecture is delicately balancing on a reduced footprint as the found boulder in the landscape. Here in the dreamlike landscape of South, of Hampi in South India. And a, and a solid and timeless due to its almost bunker-like character. The homogeneous materialization emphasizes the sculptural quality of the house that is molding itself about the site. And by lifting the tips of the wings of the wings off the ground, the relationship with the landscape is paradoxically strengthened. Here, the contradiction between architecture and nature is highlighted. The pleasure of the building does not lie in denial, but rather in a celebration of the collision of the two. Of all projects I'm going to share today here, I wouldn't say this is one of the most reflective nostalgic. It recognizes the contradictions of our contemporary world. And while it recognizes that, we feel increasingly alienated, alienated from the natural world. It, it also recognizes that we desire, in a positive sense, for permanence and belonging. Concrete a material that is solidified, shaped by the textures of its contraform, has a beautiful poetic quality. But building uh, with concrete was also felt in a way like a sin. The high embodied energy of concrete is certainly not sustainable. And building our first house with this material made us more acutely aware of some of the challenges in India. Raw materials for basic construction are increasingly harder to procure. The shortage of construction sand leads to undesirable practice, like here, where it is being mined in, at the bottom of creeks and rivers, or ca causing the coastline erosion on the mine beaches around M Mumbai. You can see them here digging up sand. And construction with bricks causes the topsoil of fertile farmlands to disappear and causes emissions of black carbon polluting the air. Now, our work is not defined by a singular preference of materials. We live in an age of scarcity, a depletion of material resources and skilled labor. A search for alternative materials led us to experimenting with bamboo, like in the screen in the repairing house we just saw, and now in the artist's retreat in Mumbai. In this project, there was one more major concern, though. The coastal nature of the site meant that, due to impending sea levels, we had to consider building on a land that may not exist in the near future. So we researched how we could build in climate resilience, use building methods that have less impact on fragile ecosystems, as well as our future ready and ac accommodate rising sea levels. This challenge is a new though. In the past, many cultures have had to develop ways to construct structures to sustain changing circumstances. And we looked for inspiration here in Indonesia, where frequent earthquakes forces people to evolve construction methods that would enable structures to withstand the violent shaking of the earth. 
This technique also had a side effect though, because the structures were light, built with flexible joints and fitted together without nails, they could be dismantled and reassembled elsewhere. I speak about this here, even though you're probably familiar with this example, because I want to blow this myth of the heroic architect as the um, supposed inventor of solutions for all our problems. The plan is quite simple. Two rooms are defined merely by rows of columns and chopped off pyramid-shaped groups with two skylights that are shifted away from each other and who define these two spaces experientially. The typology is also loosely based on the Ambalamba here in Sri Lanka. And according to me, it's one of the most beautiful public infrastructure projects of the early 19th century. Sited on a modest rock outcrop, an island amongst a sea of peat paddy fields, pilgrims, traders and travelers from all over South Asia gathered here to rest and meet and share stories with each other. The structure delicately balances on four boulders of around one meter in size and the height of the boulders carefully levels the difference between the slope of the rock surface and the horizontal plane. Space, functionality, tectonics, materialization and, and structural essence all converge here. Heavy and down to earth, but transparent and light at the same time. While in our project the steels, columns and beams are made in galvanized steel, the roof, is stru the roof structure is built out of bamboo V-shaped rafters. They are covered by a lightweight sandwich roof. And a solar skylight on top of the roof pulls up hot air from the space below and encouraging a natural flow of air across the workshops. The skylight brings in light, but it of course also generates power. And the otherwise distracting solar panels are subtly integrated into the roof design. Here you see the bolted connections of the prefabricated structure. Now, bamboo is a wonder material, but it, it also frustrates a lot of architects. It's never straight, and it varies in diameter between either ends of the poles. And I'm showing this image from the type of bamboo we get in the local market in Mumbai, because bamboo construction is still at a very nascent stage in India. And importing and transporting bamboo from like a place like Indonesia would have, of course, eliminated all the environmental benefits of a bio-based carbon absorbing material. So we may do with this crooked, uneven bamboos we got locally. We designed this diagonal zigzag layout of the rafters to avoid the irregularity of the bamboo from becoming destructive, but also make a stronger structural frame. On the right, you see a detail of how the bamboo is tied to the cement board shell. And here you see how the whole structure comes together. You see how light keeps changing, animating the space throughout the day and the night. This project is one that um, should actually not exist. But it does exist because our world has become highly dependent on palm oil. And the production of palm oil has a detrimental effect to the environment and people. Due to a shortage of labor in the plantations, many migrant workers come to Sabah from nature in neighboring countries like Indonesia or the Philippines and they leave their home country. I have uh, less time today. Uh, they leave their home country so that they can uh, earn enough to provide for their families. Because they and their children often don't have an official residential status, their children cannot go to a regular school. And the organization, Etania Schools, decided to do something about it. They started small learning centers for the children of migrant laborers who have otherwise no access to education. 
and contacted our Billion Bricks uh, partner to design a prototype school for them. The site where the organization Itania planned to build the school is located along the Padas River. And this land came for free, but also had a history of massive flooding uh, during many periods in past history. Of course, the replacement of the original rainforest by open plantations in the last decades hasn't helped this uh, uh, much. And this is the river at the new location of the school. Because of the flood risk, we propose to raise the school from the ground, not unlike much of Borneo's vernacular architecture and the typology of the longhouse. And this is what we built, a school raised on containers. And here the site, and the site during floods. We excavated a water harvesting pond and filled a mound to place the building on top of. And then placed sea containers on, on top of which we placed the school classrooms. It also created additionally below a covered space for a lunch area and a gathering space. And it acts as a buffer, the buffer zone for the river to expand, keeping the classrooms dry. Contrary to common belief, and especially amongst architects, recycled containers are not necessarily the ultimate solution for all our problems. They are not insulated, and they are often rusted and badly damaged, and they need a lot of work to become habitable spaces. And then if they do, they then become prohibitively expensive, at least for projects like this. So we decided to only accommodate non-habitable spaces in them a toilet block and storage spaces for the school. The grounds are very interactive and because play is the most important learning tool for children. The kids, the, the school building itself integrates play into the structure and kids are running up and down the mound while playing football and there are various ways to move around the building which allows the kids to find their own paths up and down the building, or they swing from trees, and they use the verandas for physical exercise classes. Every side has a story, and sometimes it's millions of years of old. The formation of the Himalayas took, pl took place 50 million years ago when the Indian subcontinent continent broke away from a larger landmass and reached Eurasia after a slow journey upwards. And then with magnificent force, it lifted up the ocean seabed, exposing layers of medium grain metamorphic rock that originated from the mud of the bottom of the ocean. And you find these rock formations everywhere near the site. And it felt therefore very natural to have these become the basic component of the project. Not a choice that made our lives easy though. Here a dozen old men slowly but patiently work on the stone masonry. First the stone is scored from the side itself. They are then shaped into somewhat rectangular blocks. And then they are positioned into place with a mud lime made of a mud lime mix. Finally, the finishing and the alignment is done on the wall itself. Most men are over 50 years old because the art of masonry has slowly disappeared and, and actually most young men have left for the city and abandoned the trade. And even though it is unintended, this material does evoke a sense of nostalgia since it won't be long for this construction method for becoming absolutely uh, obsolete. 
On top of one of the roofs, the masons here is chipping on a stone coping. I mean, what a workplace, right? This is the building tradition in this region. Load-bearing stone masonry walls and standing seam iron roofing the ladder introduced by the British. It is not nostalgia, though, that drove this choice of materials. It is not a longing for a sanitized impression of the past. It's not a celebration of crafts either. We are very much aware of the trap of fetishizing craftsmanship. And craftsmanship is often romanticized, not only for its superior quality, but because it makes a product exclusive. And this exclusionary quality is exactly why it loses the potential for positive impact. But when you have the choice of sculpting a building out of the rock on which it is founded, instead of having to cart up truckloads of sand, cement and gravel from the foothills, a painful, bumpy, steep six-hour road trip uphill, it is just plain common sense. The irony is that while Western consumers aspire to craftsmanship, the majority of the world's population, though, like in India, lives in countries that have these local craftsmen, but aspire industrial products. Here the plan. It is a very steep slope of one, one to, two, two to three, and it tears us down towards the view of the Himalayas. A boomerang-shaped structure hugs the contour on the upper level, and three additional purveyors are scattered around in the site on the lower levels. The walls are built as if they are sculpted or extruded out of the earth. Architecture is embedded, as uh, Kenneth Frampton called it, by inlaying the building into the site. Emphasizing on the solidity and massiveness of, of the wall com compositions rather than walls as separate elements. Stopping abruptly at lintel level to then receive a common lightweight timber and steel roof. The stone elements of the retreat seem to be an extension of the terracing of the Imlion agricultural terrain, merely protected and made habitable by this light horizontal roof plane. It becomes difficult to perceive where architecture stops and landscape elements take over. From one pavilion to another, you walk through a garden with the roof emphasizing the panoramic views of the Himalayas. Then a, a path takes you inside the earth to then appear on the other side of the solarium-like pavilion that reflects the fruit orchard in its faceted glass facade. The temple rooms of, are finished in a standing seam copper roof. And you see here the copper sheets that, that come on large rolls being folded. And they're then laid in between the clips of, on the roof. And with simple hand tools, the, the, the seams, they are then folded by this South Indian craftsman. Then the edges are turned in a separate piece to protect the end grain of the wood. It's, it's beautiful craftsmanship, but it's not local. The timber structure was made with Himalayan pine by a lo local carpenter, but using German screws technology. And the copper came from Sweden and installed by a South Indian team and this French specialist that you see here on the roof. Although it may not appear so, this project is, although it may appear so, this project is not a continuation of a local building tradition. The carpenter had never made a roof with these kind of spans. And the standing seam technology introduced by the British was much more primitive. I think this causes us to re-evaluate and redefine what local and traditional mean and what our valuation of it is. 
while for the inhabitants of Uttarakhand, owning a concrete frame house has become aspirational, this retreat acts as a resistance. Yes, thank you. <laughs> it offers a critique of both the modern fascination with newness and the no less modern reinvention of tradition. In the off-modern tradition, reflection and longing, estrangement and affection go together to go together. Thank you so much.